Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast that celebrates trailblazing women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis and I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners Sport England, who support The Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. I'm delighted to say that this, the 13th season of the podcast, is a serialisation of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Chapter 8. Women Talk Sport From Motti to Totti, as girl power conquers match of the day. Daily Mail, 2007 In early 2020, during the COVID-19 lockdown, cricket writer at The Telegraph, Isabel Westbury took to Twitter to share her thoughts on the lack of female representation in today's sports coverage and why she thought it was such a problem. More men named John wrote in the sports pages of today's national newspapers than women. Full stop. Across the sports pages of last Sunday's nationals, eight Johns wrote articles, as did four Neils, and a total of seven women. Of 166 sports articles, just three were on women's sport. That's less than 2%. Normally, female coverage and representation in print sports media is bad. This is worse. Isabel went on to explain that the low numbers of female sports writers are often disguised by the larger proportion of women in broadcast sports media. Why are there more women in broadcasting? Isabel feels the more visible roles make it easier to hold broadcasters accountable and create change. Also, there is probably a pretty woman fronting the sports coverage element to it, unfortunate but true, which you don't get with a print byline. It's also easier to enter the broadcast media because it's almost entirely freelance and self-employed, even at the top. Contrast this to senior sports writers as decent salaried employees. This is an almost exclusively male domain. Change is happening here, but slowly, and we're not at a stage where it's manifested in senior sports writing roles. Many junior writing roles, however, where there are some more women, are part-time, contractors, without employee benefits either, and poorly paid. So the end game is, most women in sports media are in broadcast or are freelance and on insecure contracts. So, when a pandemic hits and sport vanishes, so do the women covering it. No sport is broadcast and newspapers, who are suffering a big financial hit, scale back, dispensing of anyone who is not an employee. Well, boo-hoo, you might think. Some women have lost their jobs, So have many others. The problem is, this impacts not just the women covering sport, but the women playing it too. All of the three articles on women's sport last Sunday were written by women. Frustratingly, we remain at a stage where it is still almost exclusively women writing about women's sport. Some notable exceptions, but broadly, this is the case. Why? Meh. It's not as though men are incapable of watching women play sport or learning about it. It just isn't done enough. Nor is it encouraged by editors. Stereotyping, lazy assumptions, cheap commissioning, all at play. So, with no sport, the almost exclusively male writers, still with a job, are writing about what they know. It's human to revert to default. I would but it means articles on historical stories from an age when almost all coverage was of male sport. Articles on off-field luxury lifestyles, so male athletes. Generous donations, again, only male sports stars with the means to do so. Big money takeovers and transfers. So here we are, few women covering sport, fewer women being covered. 
is a difficult challenge with an ambitious end goal of male and female sports journalists able to report equally on male and female sport. While some male journalists consider women's sport to be second class to the male equivalent and prefer to stick with covering the sports they know, other men have been hugely supportive of women's sport. I can understand, however, that some of these male journalists worry about the approach they should take. Do they fully embrace covering women's sport but risk being accused of stepping in to take opportunities from female colleagues when they perhaps aren't as familiar with the sports and players. I remember there being much criticism of some of the very famous male rugby broadcasters brought in to commentate on the women's sevens at the Rio Olympics. While they were well-meaning and professional, they clearly did not have the background knowledge of the women's game or the GB players in the way they would have for the men's games. From a quality of coverage perspective, it would have been far better to have had pundits and commentators who were familiar with the women's game, the likes of Maggie Alfonsi or Sue Day, who have both done a great job of commentating on men's and women's rugby in the past. It is possible for this older generation of established male sports journalists to find the right balance, though, as Rebecca Myers from the time saw at the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2019. Rebecca was full of praise for the country's heavyweight sports writers, mainly male and middle-aged, who descended on France to report, sensing a raw public appetite and dawning of a momentous new age. These men have been the embodiment of the feminist phrase male ally, highly conscious of being sent by their sports desks to parachute in and steal bylines from their more junior female colleagues. Instead, they have set out to champion us, tweeting out our pieces and praising our work. They have taught us not only how to match their impressive red wine consumption, but to be prouder, more confident and to blow our own trumpets. And while I absolutely believe that more women throughout sports journalism will eventually result in increased coverage for women's sport, it doesn't necessarily follow that just because a woman is at the top, the content at the paper or station will naturally become more balanced. A case in point is the Mail on Sunday. Despite having a female sports editor, Alison Curvin, for over a decade, No one would claim the paper is in any way a champion for the coverage of women's sport. I do wonder if this might be because, as the first female sports editor at a national newspaper, Alison was keen to establish herself as a traditional sports editor and actively chose not to cover more women's sport. This point is reinforced in the US, as Tony Bruce says, in communication and sport. One myth that needs addressing is the claim that more women in sports journalism would create change. Evidence to date suggests that women journalists make little difference. A combination of their low numbers and the overwhelmingly macho habitus of sports journalism makes for complex negotiations for female journalists. Historically, we have had great female sport reporters, but, as Tony says, there have not been enough to cause change. Resistance to them has included men assuming women wouldn't understand the game or know the rules, something Jackie Oakley tells me was an issue she experienced. The biggest barrier was the mistrust of what on earth would she know? I bet she doesn't know about our team. Bet she couldn't have the passion. I actually heard those things, which are hilarious. There was a manager I interviewed after a Premier League game. I could tell he was a bit of a dinosaur, even though he wasn't that old, but I could just tell he was looking through me. I was asking very fair questions. I just knew he thought, what was the point? And then I thought, well, I'm just going to remark on a couple of his tactical changes. And he looked at me suddenly, 
looked me in the eye and he said, you know your football, don't you? And I just thought, oh, this is pathetic. Really, it was quite pathetic. Another issue was that women were not allowed access to the male changing rooms where male reporters would get post-match interviews with the stars of a sport. This is not a fight about nudity, it's a fight about power and access, said one of the contributors to the ESPN documentary Let Them Wear Towels, which highlights the challenges female journalists faced at this time. In the US, it was not until 1978 that female sports journalists were allowed to enter locker rooms for interviews. Melissa Ludke, a Sports Illustrated reporter, sued the New York Yankees for not letting her interview players in the locker room during the 1977 World Series, and a judge ruled in her favour, saying it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Talking about this new post-match access to the locker room, the hugely respected award-winning British sports journalist Sue Mott, who was working in the US at the time, says, if the men were allowed in the locker room, so were we. It was excellent access, but I often had to keep my eyes on the ceiling. Sue would go on to become Sports Feature Writer of the Year in 1995. Though it was a positive outcome for female sports reporters, sadly, many women were punished as a result. After I broke the locker room barrier in 1975, the hate mail started. I was a whore, a prostitute, and women's libber, said Robin Herman, the first female sports writer for the New York Times. Female journalists were also harassed by players and coaches who did not want them in the locker rooms with their male equivalents. Lisa Olson, a journalist who complained about being harassed in an NFL locker room in 1990, then faced such public hostility, obscene phone calls, hate mail and death threats, that she left the US for six years to work in Australia to get away from the abuse. And this was before the days of trolling on social media. In terms of women coming into sports journalism, regrettably, it does not look as if much will change anytime soon. A quick straw poll of current sports journalism courses in the UK shows that while more women than men graduate each year with journalism degrees, when it comes to sports journalism, women make up less than 5% of the intake each year. Things can also be tough after graduation when you enter the world of work, as former sports reporter Joe Tung remembers. I found it really difficult going out to football clubs. Part of my job was to go to press conferences or go to football grounds to do match reports. Press boxes were very, very intimidating. I wasn't part of the male clique, wasn't part of the press pack. There were lots of assumptions as a woman. You'd turn up to collect your media pass and you would be directed to the catering door. Or you'd go into the press room and they'd ask, where's the team sheet, love? Where's the coffee? Jo also recounts the sexism she experienced working in radio when she edited the BBC's flagship football phone-in 606. It was tough. Most of the presenters were fine with me because they knew I knew football. But there were times when I remember telling some presenters off for banter in the office, and it didn't go down well at all. I can have a laugh outside the office, but there's certain things I don't want in the office, and it didn't go down well. I was made to feel that I was a bit of an outsider, and I couldn't take it. It was personal jokes about how I looked. Fortunately, Things have very much improved in this area, especially in recent years, following campaigns such as Me Too. It's changed so much, continues Jo. The things that used to go on in the studio, in the workplace, when I started, you'd be out immediately for stuff like that now. 
What's also changed over the decades is the presence of trailblazing women in sports media to inspire the next generation. Julie Welsh was Fleet Street's first female football reporter in 1973, and she shares many extraordinary anecdotes in her book, The Fleet Street Girls. Making my first visit to White Hart Lane, the Spurs Stadium, as a reporter rather than a fan, I did not know where to enter the ground. I was directed to an oak-panelled hall. Spotting a door marked Press, I pushed it open and barged in, only to be confronted by a line of my fellow reporters facing the urinals. She points out, I think we've forgotten, or are too young to have experienced, the entrenched sexism that meant it was completely normal for women to be barred from places or institutions. As the owner of a vagina, I was not allowed to join the Football Writers Association. This, too, was when a nice girl didn't go into a pub unless she was with a man. Asked about being a trailblazer, she says, I feel ambivalent about the trailblazer thing because I'm being singled out. I was very matter-of-fact about it. That was my job. It was nice to be the first woman. But I was pleased when Sue Mott came along in the late 1970s for the Sunday Times just to be not the only one. Another much-respected pioneer of women's sports journalism was Vicky Orvis, who tragically died of breast cancer in February 2019. Vicky had been the first female football reporter on the staff of a tabloid newspaper in Britain. In 2016, she commented, I thought when I started out in tabloids in 1995, there would be a trajectory of women starting to emerge in sports writing but it has not been the case at all. In fact, it has got worse. Women in sports writing peaked in 2000. The only females at the Sun are me and two secretaries. In the final weeks of Vicky's life, she set up an apprenticeship for a young female football reporter in her name at the Sun. Isabel Barker was the first woman to take up this position and she now reports on plenty of football, including the women's game. What a fabulous legacy for Vicky to have left. Other highly regarded female sports writers include Martha Kellner, formerly The Guardian's chief sports reporter, who made the move to broadcasting and is now a sports correspondent for Sky News. Rebecca Myers at The Times, who is a lead reporter for the Sunday Times Sports Women of the Year Awards. Kate Rowan, long-established and much-respected rugby reporter at The Telegraph, Susie Rack and Louise Taylor, football writers at The Guardian, and Fee Thomas and Molly McElwee at The Telegraph. Three notable female sports writers who recently made the move from print journalism to The Athletic, the subscription-based sports website, are Amy Lawrence, former football writer at The Guardian and Observer, Sarah Shepherd, formerly of The Times and Sport magazine, and Katie Wyatt, former football writer at The Telegraph. The gender balance for sports broadcasting feels better than in print. The trailblazers in this field will be familiar to older sports fans and include Mary Rain, the first woman to cover a football match for BBC Radio's Sports Report in the 1960s, and Sally Jones, BBC Breakfast's first female sports anchor in 1986. Sally recalls how tough it was for women commentators at the time. If we made the slightest slip, chauvinist critics had a field day, concluding that all women must be useless sports presenters. If Steve Ryder made a blooper, no one said all men were rubbish, just that Steve was having an off day. Other familiar names include the sadly departed Helen Rollison, the first female presenter of BBC's Grandstand in the 1990s, and the much-admired Eleanor Oldroyd. Talk to women working in sports journalism today, and many will comment that they were inspired and often supported by the first lady of fighting talk, BBC's Ellie Oldroyd.
With a career that began in commercial radio, Ellie joined BBC Radio Shropshire as a sports producer in 1986 before joining BBC Sport in 1988. By 1995, she became the first female presenter of Sports Report and still hosts many weekly five live shows today. In both 2014 and 2016, her brilliance was publicly recognised when she was named the Sports Journalists Association Broadcast Presenter of the Year. Ellie was very honest when I asked her how she dealt with being a woman in what was a very male environment of sports media. You had to have a thick skin. You think about the Me Too movement now. If we'd talked about that then, I wonder whether we'd have got jobs. I do think I've put up with things, you know. You do turn a blind eye. You do smile prettily, laugh off remarks because you don't want to make a fuss. You don't want to make a big deal about it. You don't want to damage these fragile male egos, for God's sake, because you worry about your future. You worry about your job. So even though I had strong male advocates, my bosses, there were plenty of people that would have done anything to undermine me or to make me feel small or just put me in my place. In terms of TV... Sue Barker became the first female to host a question of sport in 1997. As a side note, whilst it's wonderful that Sue hosted the world's longest-running TV sports quiz for over 20 years, it's disappointing that the show has never had a female captain, apart from a guest captain appearance by Mary Peters in 1976. Perhaps that will change soon, with the announcement that this was the final series for Sue and the current captains, Phil Tufnell and Matt Dawson. In more recent years, the hugely professional presenters who have become familiar faces on our screens have included the likes of Kelly Cates, Reshmin Chowdhury, Jessica Crichton, Kirsty Gallagher, Carthy Nana Sagaram, Hazel Irvine, Jackie Oatley, Susie Perry and Georgie Thompson. Gabby Logan has been a particularly key figure with her superb broadcasting ability as she moves seamlessly from football to athletics or rugby union. Similarly, it's always a joy to see Claire Balding presenting, from her early days in horse racing through to the boat race, Wimbledon, Olympics, Paralympics and rugby league, The last, a sport that holds her in such high regard that she was recently appointed president of the RFL. Former world-class athletes are also making names for themselves as presenters and pundits, including Issa Guha, the first female expert summariser for BBC's Test Match Special in 2014, Maggie Alfonsi, the first woman pundit on live men's rugby on ITV in 2015, Enia Luko, the first female pundit on BBC's Match of the Day and Live Men's Football on ITV in 2016, and Alex Scott, the first female pundit on Live Sky Games in 2018. The impact of Alex Scott has been phenomenal. Despite being repeatedly trolled on Twitter just for giving an opinion on men's football, she has remained the ultimate professional Flawless across both men's and women's football. On radio too, women's voices are finally being heard more. Alison Mitchell was the first woman to commentate regularly on Test Match Special and is Britain's leading female cricket broadcaster. A former winner of the Sports Broadcaster of the Year at the Sports Journalism Awards, She was also the first woman to commentate on international cricket for ABC Grandstand in Australia. Vicky Sparks has consistently pushed for the coverage of women's football at the BBC. She was part of the BBC's team to cover the World Cup in Russia in 2018, where she became the first ever female commentator for a live TV World Cup match. Although the gender balance for sports broadcasting is better, than in print media, women can still find it difficult to establish themselves as experts in their field. The reaction 
to the announcement that Jackie Oatley was to be the first woman presenting on Match of the Day in 2007 showed that so much about the media's attitude to women and sport hasn't changed significantly. I was just a journalist and I wanted to tell the story, Jackie told me. I did not want to become part of the story and so I just wanted to seamlessly slot in. So therefore, I didn't tell anyone and I just hoped it wouldn't find its way into the national media. Unfortunately, it made its way into the Daily Mail on the Tuesday before the Saturday and that's where it all started. There was this hideous build-up in which I was front-page news, back-page news. From Motti to Totti was the headline in one paper. Is football ready for Jackie Oatley was the front page of The Guardian. A massive photograph on the front page of The Telegraph. It was enormous. I just felt this overwhelming wave of pressure and I felt extremely lonely and isolated at that time. I was single. I was living in a flat on my own. I was just practising and working the whole time. I didn't want to be a celebrity. On the contrary, I really, really did not want any profile whatsoever. I just wanted to be as good a football commentator as I could. Does Jackie think things are becoming more balanced for women working in the media today? I think it's still extremely male-dominated in local radio. I'm not too sure why, but I don't see too many women in the local radio press box or even local newspapers. So nationally broadcast-wise, yes, there are a lot more women now on TV and on the radio, which is absolutely brilliant. But I do worry a little bit about the supply line, because really that's where you need to get your experience, where there's less pressure in a regional print media and broadcast environment. And you could learn from people and kick on. I asked Anna Kessel, editor of Women's Sport at The Telegraph, about any significant moments of sexist behaviour she remembers as a young female sports reporter. There were just so many. And at first, I was young. And there was nothing so terrible that I was traumatised by it. It was stuff that I could brush off and perhaps didn't realise, really, the weight of what was happening at the time. I saw it as a bit of a challenge and thought, I'll tough it out. But I think, looking back, I realised more the significance of all those. Some of them were microaggressions, as we now say. I went to interview a couple of well-known referees and they just refused to behave and they refused to be interviewed by me on their own. They wanted to be interviewed together and then they just kind of destroyed my interview and all they wanted to talk about was my arse, basically. In the future, Anna hopes that as well as men not acting like this, more women will feel more empowered in those situations to say, sorry, I'm just going to stop the interview now because you're not behaving. She adds, I could have done that, but I didn't feel that I could do that. Didn't even occur to me. The vitriol that many female sports reporters receive from men must also be hugely off-putting to women considering journalism as a career. Social media has clearly made this worse and it seems particularly bad for women working in football. At the FIFA World Cup in 2018, there were numerous incidents recorded of fans groping, kissing or attempting to kiss female reporters. One man who shouted insults at Mexican journalists Adziri Cardenas, while she was filming a report, returned moments later and tried to grab her crotch. Another incident, widely shared across social media at the time, saw a man attempt to kiss Brazilian journalist Julia Guimarães while she was preparing to go live for Sport TV. She firmly told him, This is not polite. This is not right. Never do this. Never do this to a woman, Okay." and he was heard apologising in the background. For female sports journalists in Brazil, this isn't new, with more than two-thirds of female journalists saying they've been sexually harassed on the job, according to a survey from Brazil's Investigative Journalism Association.
In 2018, the women set up a movement to call out the harassment using the hashtag LetHerWork. It highlights the challenges they face working in an industry dominated by male colleagues and fans. Stories emerged of fans shouting prostitute at female reporters for entire games with the authorities doing nothing to stop them. Journalist Aline Nastari says she remembers crying after one incident but did not tell anyone because she felt ashamed. From the moment you make it public and you feel that you're in it together, that there are a lot of people experiencing the same thing, you feel supported to fight for something. Let her work symbolises this. It's that moment when we're all together, we're all united. The women have also been working with the police and prosecutors to ensure that Brazil's laws against defamation and public insult are enforced in stadiums around the country. Something that fascinates me is why women writing or talking about sport enrages so many men. You would not generally expect to see insults on social media mocking women who present on the news or talk about arts, medicine, travel or science, but sport generates a unique negative reaction. It's as if men feel they own sport and that women reporting on it are somehow trespassing. When Martha Kellner was writing at The Guardian, she worried that social media platforms like Twitter were making things worse. I've been called a slag and told I don't know what I'm doing because I'm a woman. It's more common when I write about football than about a sport like athletics, but there are people in darkened rooms spoiling for a fight. We may not get more online abuse than men, but it can be more vitriolic and insulting, and our gender is often the first port of call for someone sending an abusive tweet. In early 2021, a particularly horrible incident saw football pundit Karen Carney, a superb former professional player with 144 England caps, literally driven from Twitter by the avalanche of negativity she received from Leeds United fans. Karen had made a comment about the team's performance, part of her job as a TV pundit reporting on the match after all, and the club had clipped the comment and shared it on social media. The club's owner, Andrea Radrizzani, stoked the flames by resharing the tweet, saying Carney's remarks were completely unnecessary and disrespectful to our club. This led to a mass of hideous sexist trolling of Karen on social media. I asked Ian Wright, an enthusiastic male ally for women's football and a well-known sports pundit himself, if he worried the negativity female pundits faced might put them off these roles. When they're on the television, if they say anything, then you start seeing a stereotypical she should be back in the kitchen or what's she doing here? It's horrible to see. I do feel for the ladies because they themselves have got no wiggle room. When they're on the television, they say anything wrong and they're literally taken to the cleaners. People want them cancelled and it's unfair. But Ian thinks things will change, especially when audiences realise how good the female pundits are. I was on TV with Leanne Sanderson the other day. It was a joy. She knows so much. If the men were as prepared as these women, they wouldn't get the stick the women are getting. They're more prepared than some of the blokes. They've made me up my game. When you listen to what they say, they make you have to research more. And that's what it's about. So they shouldn't be put off by it because they're doing the work to be on there. They deserve to be on there. Another reason that might be putting women off from pursuing a career in sports media is the obsession from some channels with their physical appearance. Whereas male presenters are appointed for their sports knowledge, journalistic ability and skill in front of the camera, women need to have all this and look good in a tight dress and a pair of high heels. In 2020, it was reported that female presenters at Sky Sports News had complained after the company sent out a survey that asked viewers to rate their appearances. The audience feedback survey gave viewers the opportunity to rate female presenters as sexy, good-looking, irritating, 
lovable or pretentious. Sky vehemently deny that the women in their figure-hugging outfits on Sky Sports are there as window dressing alongside their male colleagues, something that Gabby Logan claimed in 2013 when she left the station to work at the BBC. But even today, if you Google Sky Sports presenters, you'll see sites for the top 10 sexiest Sky Sports presenters, hottest Sky Sports presenters ever, and Sky Sports hotties. Funnily enough, they're not referring to the male presenters. Ellie Aldroyd reflects on how unpleasant it was for female sports presenters at sports events. I remember when women were first admitted to the Professional Footballers Association dinner, and it was a really horrible atmosphere in lots of ways. It's really blokey, and I remember being there with one of the very attractive female sports presenters and walking with her to the ladies' loo. I was like her wingwoman, and she walked between these tables of young footballers all just leering in the most horrible way. This blokey world is changing for the better now, but throughout the 90s, and until quite recently, it was a difficult place to be in. Sadly, it's not just young women starting out who see gender inequality affect their careers. Anna Kessel reflects, I think, as I got older, the stakes got higher. This was a career that I was now committing to. I got married, I started a family, and I think the structural issues really kick in then. Can you be a working mum with a child? Can you be a correspondent? What about when you've got to travel the world? What about the long hours? What about breaking news stories? Can the industry accommodate working mothers? And at the time, the answer definitely wasn't a resounding yes. And it's interesting that there are still so few working mums doing the role. What looks like a positive shift for women in sports media has been the attitude of the Telegraph. Both Anna and Vicky Hodges, her deputy at the Telegraph, are part-time working mothers and doing a brilliant job. Another very positive sign that things might finally be changing occurred at the British Sports Journalism Awards in 2019, where, for the first time, all four key writing prizes were won by women. One of my all-time favourite journalists, Marina Hyde from The Guardian, won the Sports Columnist and Sports Writer of the Year Awards, Alison Rudd at The Times won Sports Feature Writer of the Year, and Laura Lambert at the Daily Mail won the Sports Scoop Prize with her colleague Matt Lawton for their investigation revealing how Saracens had broken the salary cap rules and also won the Sports News Reporter Award. Laura has since moved on to work at the BBC. Another inaugural female win that night saw CNN anchor Christina McFarlane named Broadcast Journalist of the Year. Christina said she was stunned to be the first woman to win this award, but shared an inspiring comment on Instagram. For anyone who's ever experienced a serious case of imposter syndrome like me, proof, trust your instincts, follow your gut and don't take no for an answer. There is no doubt that the recognition of these fantastic female journalists will be a huge inspiration to younger women entering the profession today. Thank you so much for listening to the serialisation of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. If you'd like a copy, it's available in hardback and paperback in all good bookshops and online. The Game Changers podcast is free to listen to on all podcast platforms. Head over to fearlesswomen.co.uk to find out more about all of the incredible game changers I've spoken to in previous series. There are over a hundred of them, including elite athletes, journalists, coaches, scientists, broadcasters and CEOs. As well as listening to all the episodes on the website, you can find out more about the Women's Sport Collective 
a free inclusive network for all women working in sport and you can register for the fearless women newsletter a weekly review of the global developments in women's sport do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on linkedin instagram and twitter at sue anstis Finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast, I'd be so grateful if you could do two things. Firstly, if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I'd really appreciate it. And secondly, if there's anyone in your life, at home or work, who you think might enjoy the podcast, please do let them know about it and help us spread the word about women's sport and the stories of these incredible game changers.